I'm Carol Cohn, and welcome to Purpose 360, the podcast that unlocks the power of purpose to ignite business and social impact. I am thrilled to have Alan Murray, CEO of Fortune Media, as my guest on not one Purpose 360 podcast, but two Because Alan has been a journalist his entire career, from CNBC to the Wall Street Journal to Fortune Magazine, Alan has interviewed dozens and dozens and dozens of CEOs, and he has watched their journeys from shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism. Indeed, his new book, Tomorrow's Capitalist, which is now my favorite book next to Paul Pullman's Net Positive. The subtitle of this book is My Search for the Soul of Business. It's a must read for any purpose professional, no matter where you are in your career, because we're constantly trying to up level the purpose of our organizations, the execution and embedding of purpose. And you will find story after story after story in this book. It is absolutely fantastic. So today's interview, we're going to be diving into the book. Alan's going to talk about being physically sitting with CEOs, hearing their intimate stories of how their view of business and commerce has dramatically changed in our hyper-transparent world filled with so, so many tough issues. I asked Alan, how does he define this transformation of business? And he said, you know, Carol, let's just call it something simple. It's creating human-centered organizations. Alan Murray is one of the captains of stakeholder-based capitalism, human-centered organizations, Join me. It's a fascinating conversation for part one and part two. Welcome to the show, Alan. Thanks, Carol. Great to be with you. I have to tell our listeners that um, Alan, he's the CEO of Fortune Media. And he's, and today we're going to talk about his new book that is coming out called Tomorrow's Capitalist. And Alan has his own podcast called Leadership Next. And he has, as you're going to hear, the most incredible voice, but he's got the most amazing mind and a great heart. They all come together. He has a wonderful co-host on Leadership Next, Ellen McGirt. And I would say next to Purpose 360, which any of our purpose (laughs) purveyors should listen to, you must listen to Leadership Next. It's just wonderful. So um, thank you for just everything that you do, Alan. It's amazing to advance business to have a soul. Yeah, well, thank well, thank you for having me on to talk about it. It's been an an interesting journey. And I, I think we're at a moment for business that's You know, I've been doing this for the better part of four decades. I think we're at a moment that's uh, uh, the most interesting and promising moment for business uh, in my career, certainly. So that's a great segue. To can you share with with our listeners your background? Because you've had a just an amazingly fascinating and accomplished career. Oh well, thank you. Well, it, so I am CEO of Fortune Media, but the truth is, I'm a lifelong journalist. I I literally started when I was nine years old. Had my own little neighborhood newspaper. Would walk up and down the street and t- you know take notes on people who lost their dog or their grandmother was visiting and write it all up and. Print printed out on a jelly sheet copying machine and sell it in the neighborhood. So I've been doing this for a long, for a long time. Uh, um, at work many, many years at the Wall Street Journal in Washington and in, in New York, came to Fortune six years ago. And, and Carol, the one thing I would say is I, I, through most of my career, I always thought of myself as somebody who was trying to explain the world, not change the world. And it's really over the last decade and and a result of my reporting where I heard more and more of the best businesses focusing on purpose and focusing on their social impact for the first time uh, that that I came to realize that Fortune had a very special uh, role to play in making business better. Uh, so it's it, it has been a 
a, a journey and a transformation for me, but I'm, I'm happy to be where I am today. I think that's great that you had a, a, a neighborhood newspaper because I did too, but I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> oh, you did. Yeah, but my, I only had a few issues, but I didn't sell mine. Did anybody really buy yours? Well, it was a nickel. <laughs> okay. But they did. They and, did. And it was a nickel, and I was limited because of my uh, method of production. You know, this is I, I'm 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 probably a good bit older than you are, Carol. <laughs> uh, but my, this was before the age of copying machines. So I had a jelly sheet machine and my my poor mother would have to type out the newspaper using special carbon paper. And then I could put that on the jelly sheet and then print off 30 <laughs> copies. But, hey, 30. Then, but then it was over. 30 was all I could get. And then if I wanted more, I would have to make her type it up again. So I was limited to a circulation of 30, but I got a, a nickel a piece. Oh, my 30. God. So you're a capitalist from the very, <laughs> from the very beginning. <laughs> that's, that's great. So let's go. Let's fast forward. So from your neighborhood newspaper to um, tomorrow's capitalist. So why did you write the book? Um, you know, what 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 was the inflection point? Say, I've got to write this book. Well, I wrote it because I was in an unusual position, both at the Wall Street Journal and at Fortune, to uh, spend a lot of time talking to the CEOs of large organizations, either for my reporting or for the conferences that I did at both organizations or for video interviews or podcasts or whatever. I had a pretty unique perch uh, from which I could talk to the people who are running the largest corporations of the world. It's a privilege. That's why we become journalists, right? We get to do things that we really have no business doing. And, <laughs> and, and, and over the course of the last decade, I started hearing more and more of these CEOs really uh, talking more sincerely about purpose, about their impact on society. You know, I remember, I think it was maybe six years ago, that John Donahoe, who is now the CEO of Nike, but at that time, he had just left eBay uh, and had gone on a year's sabbatical and gone to a monastery in uh, Asia and and came back and was sitting in my office telling me about, you know, what he had decided to do with the rest of his life. And he said, I realize I'm passionate about business, but I also believe business can be a platform for for societal change and that you can make a real impact on society. I kept hearing more and more CEOs talking that way. And I would always, as a journalist, I would say, why are you saying this? You know, I, I never, the people, I've been doing this for four decades. I haven't had these conversations before. Why, why are you taking this approach? And first and foremost was employees. Over time, there became a bit of, of consumer in it, some of it, like in the case of John Donahoe, it was a personal passion. But for a variety of reasons that I kept exploring, it was clear something very big was changing. And to your question, like what was the moment when I said I have to write about this? I guess it was probably when the pandemic hit, because in in February of 2020, when the pandemic hit and it became clear the economy was going to fall into a recession. My initial reaction based on my history covering business was, oh, all this stakeholder capitalism stuff is going to go away. It's going to go on the back burner because every business is going to have to be heads down looking at the bottom line and they say, oh, that can wait. Uh, and instead, you know, we at Fortune, we were pulling together these virtual conversations with 25 or 30 CEOs. I kept I kept hearing the exact opposite, that instead of pulling away, they were doubling down and. What I came to realize was that the the pandemic was in and of itself a stakeholder crisis. People were worried about the health and the mental health of their employees and of their customers. And and so companies doubled down. Even on the environment, uh, there was a kind of a sense of our common fragility that caused companies to accelerate their environmental commitments during the pandemic. So, you know, it was at that point that I said, wow, this is not a fad. This is not a temporary thing. This is not a bunch of woke CEOs trying to play politics. This is something very fundamental in the way business operates, and it, it deserves a book. What do you hope this book will accomplish? Two things. One is I hope it will will take what I believe the best companies are already doing and make it standard practice for most, if not every company, one. And, 
But then, too, I, I hope it will address the widespread cynicism of the broader public about what's happening here. I spent 28 years of my life working at the Wall Street Journal. I read it uh, every day. But I've really been taken aback by the view of the editors of the Wall Street Journal that this is all a bunch of woke CEOs trying to play politics or curry favor with Democratic politicians, because I know from my reporting and my efforts that that's not what's going on. What's going on is a and and we can talk about this here, but what's going on is a fundamental change in the in the mechanics uh, uh, and the orientation of business. So. Uh, the other thing I hope this book will do will uh, would be to address some of that cynicism uh, that this is not a silver bullet. This is not the answer to all our problems. Business can't fully replace the role of government. But there is something going on that is very significant and very positive, And people need to recognize it and encourage it and nurture it. Well, first of all, we're going to send you over the Wall Street Journal. We're going to get, we're going to buy a lot of books and we're going to send them to all the writers at the Wall Street Journal. Then we're going to get you a platform at one of their conferences. I, I don't know if I can do that. That'd be pretty cool. Um, I, you have a wonderful subhead in the book and it says, my search for the soul of business. So I want to ask you, what constitutes the soul of business? This is an interesting kind of, it's a personal journey and a historical journey. I never would have talked about the soul of business 10 years ago. And I don't think any CEO would have talked to me about the soul of business. But, you know, it's kind of like my, my, moving up Maslow's hierarchy on a social level. Uh, I, I have a colleague, Jeff Colvin, who puts who, who oh, put it Jeff. this way. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah he's, he's wonderful. He wrote a book a couple of years ago uh, called Humans Are Underrated. And one of the things he said in that book that struck me was, he said, we spent 100, 150 years of human history trying to make people better machines. I mean, that's kind of what scientific management of the Frederick, Frederick Winslow Taylor and the, the kind of stuff that was happening uh, during the industrial era. It was about getting people to work in lockstep like machines. And we've reached a new era where the machines are going to take care of themselves. Thank you very much. <laughs> right. uh, we're going to have smart machines that can do that. And what we need is people who can be better people. Mm. So it's really kind of a, a humanization of business uh, that we're talking about here. And I, I think following that thread, uh, you know, I've had more, again, more and more conversations with CEOs who say, look, businesses are made up made up of people. I mean, you, you, you'll get this from someone like Tim Cook. You'll get it from someone like uh, one of my favorites is Anil Bushri at Workday. So businesses are social organizations. They're made up of people. People have values. If people have values, company have to, companies have to have values. And if companies have values, companies have a soul. Ah, okay. The trajectory. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I think that's the trajectory we're on. Uh, and, and that's what you've seen in, in the last five years. Carol, I'm sorry, you, you get me excited about this and then I just take off and talk. So, Oh, it, no, go for it. No, you're great. This is what I'm having here. At one part of my career, this is like 2002 to 2005, I had a nightly uh, television show on CNBC. Uh, Gloria Borger was my co-host for a big part of that. And and it was kind of a tumultuous time uh, politically and in terms of business and I would frequently, when there was a, a kind of a controversial story going on, would frequently be trying to get CEOs to talk about it, say, come, come on the show and, and, and talk about this. And the standard response of every CEO, and again, this is only 2005, it's not that long ago, the standard response of every CEO was, if, it's, if it doesn't directly affect my bottom line and it's controversial, there is no way I'm going to talk about it. I am right. under my desk, keeping my mouth shut. <laughs> right. It's right. not going to happen. They just didn't do it. They said, I, I'm going to focus on the, on the, my financial returns and anything that affects that I'll talk about and anything that doesn't affect that, keep me out of it. And, and, and you think about where we are today. What a, what a, I, I, I tried to trace it back. I think Mark Benioff at Salesforce played an important role when Indiana passed its religious liberties law in 2015, I guess it was, it was perceived as being, uh, as being 
discriminatory against uh, LGBTQ people. Uh, and Mark Benioff said, we're going to take our Salesforce business out of Indiana if you're going to do this. And then you had not too long after that, North Carolina passed a bill limiting transgender access to public bathrooms. And a bunch of companies, including Bank of America, which is the largest single employer in the state of North Carolina, said, no, you're not going to do that. Um, uh, it was amazing. That was that was the kind of issue that only five years earlier, no CEO ever would have t- transgender access to bathrooms. Are you kidding me? It doesn't directly affect my bottom line. I'm not going to talk about it. Um, Ed Bastian in uh, Atlanta uh, uh, after the Parkland shootings ended ended the uh, the plan for NRA discounts to go to the NRA conv- convention. Uh, uh, Ken Frazier of Merck led a revolt against uh, the Trump administration's advisory councils because of the ambivalent response to the riots in Charlottesville. You've just had this explosion. And the most extraordinary uh, example of it just happened uh, in the last two months, which is hundreds of companies voluntarily pulling their business out of Russia, not because they were forced to by sanctions. Some were forced by sanctions, but most of them did it because they said, we're not going to stand by for this. So uh, so you've had this explosion of companies in the just the last six years expressing, uh, making strong public expressions of their values as companies, which is the kind of thing that never happened before. As you, as, as someone who's been in this plowing in this field for a long time, you know, you, you, you know, you could get a Patagonia to do it, but for the most part, the companies were hiding under their desk when controversy arose. Yeah. I think I was plowing with a mule versus today, a com- <laughs> com- combine. It was many years ago, but that's why I love you. You're like my soulmate. Like, oh my God, you, I've got Paul Pullman on one side and Alan Murray on the other, and you can make me into a Carol sandwich anytime. Um, <laughs> let's go. I want to go to more of the soul because you went to the Vatican. On December 3rd, 2016, and you wrote, the titans of business and and commerce gathered in the house of God. This is the beginning of the book, listeners. It's a great book. You've got to get the book. And you said 100 corporate chieftains gathered in the Sistine Chapel. And so I, I almost and I love the way it opens the book because it just draws you in. So what was it like? I mean, you're heading up this delegation. You're talking to Pope Francis. I mean, that must have been like this my gigantic tipping point. So do tell, share with us some of the intimate details. It was such a great moment. I mean, that was that was the Fortune Global Forum, which is a conference that we had been doing for we've been doing for more than 20 years in different cities around the world. But go back and think for a minute about what was going on in 2016. Uh, You had the Brexit vote in the UK and a lot of businesses looked at that and said, wow, you know, no major business person was in favor of Brexit. Really no authority of any sort, uh, with the exception of a few, you know, uh, rebel political leaders was in favor of Brexit. They all said this is going to be bad for the country and bad for the economy. And yet the people said, well, screw you. Right. We're going to vote for it. Right. Me- meanwhile, in the United States, you had this amazing election going on where Donald Trump was the uh, was the uh, candidate of the Republican Party, and he was attacking globalization, attacking free trade, all the things that had built large businesses had taken them to success. And on the other side, you had, uh, you know, it ultimately was Hillary Clinton, but she came very close to losing to Bernie Sanders, who was a declared socialist. You know, we thought we thought after the Berlin Wall well, we thought socialism was over. And all of a sudden, the United, the Democratic Party of the United States is is looking, coming very close to nominating a socialist to run for president. And I just found a lot of these business leaders were saying, wow, what is going on in the world? Um, the, the the politics is leaving us behind. We don't we don't identify with either of these movements, either the Brexit Trump movement on the one hand or the Bernie Sanders socialism capitalism war- isn't working on the other hand, said, if we don't figure out a better way to do what we do, we're going to lose our operating licenses. So so in, in some sense, it was like existential fear. So the world is moving away from us. Existential fear. Okay. Wow. And so when the opportunity came up, 
you know, said, well, let's let's take these CEOs to Rome, do the Fortune Global Forum there, have no political leaders involved for the first time at a Fortune Global Forum. He said, forget the politicians. This is just business leaders and focus on we had breakout groups during the Friday that we met. What can the private sector do to address these big global social problems that the Pope and the rest of us are concerned about, whether it's inequality or access to water or global warming? or And we had uh, uh, a great day of just really productive discussions on things the private sector could do in each of those areas. We wrote up the results that evening and translated them and sent them over to the Vatican so that the Pope could see him. Then the next morning, we went to the Vatican. We had the opportunity to take these 100 CEOs into the Sistine Chapel before it was open to the public, which was just a, an a, a amazing experience. I, uh, you know, we had we had to put them on a bus at like six o'clock in the morning so they didn't have time for breakfast. And uh, we had been told that there was a, uh, a at the back end of the Sistine Chapel, a little coffee shop where they could get their breakfast. Well, the little coffee shop had one person working an espresso <laughs> machine and some <laughs> croissants. And so we're, we're standing there at the at the end of the Sistine Chapel at one point, and one of the CEOs, who I will not mention by name, comes up to me and said, this is outrageous. There's a 25-minute line in the coffee shop to get <laughs> coffee. And, you know, I just pointed up to the ceiling and said, dude, <laughs> think about where you are. A little patience here. You don't have to be Type A all the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, That's great. Uh, but but then we went from there to the Clementine Hall and met with Pope Francis. We had been told the Pope would give us like 10 minutes, but he had actually read what we had sent the night before and was so impressed. These were big companies. You know, you're talking about companies like Siemens and uh, and IBM and uh, uh, Campbell Soup and the huge companies that had uh, uh, when he saw what they had done the day before and realized, wow, these people really do have the potential and the power to change the world if they put their minds to it. He was impressed, stayed for over an hour, greeted each of the CEOs individually. Uh, and so it was a it was just and and I had the opportunity to sit. You know, there was a row of CEOs going to greet the Pope and then turn and walk back to their seats. And I was sitting right there at the front. So I got to see each CEO at the turn and see the look on their faces. And you could you could tell which ones were Catholics because they were in tears. Um, but the, but you saw just the impression that each of these uh, people had on their face when they made the turn. And so just to finish the story, I warned you, Carol, that you get me going on oh, these no, things. I, I, love talk it. For I, love too, it. I talk I, for too long. That, but, that's fine. But to, but to finish the story, uh, every, this is the first time, first event we had ever done where every one of the CEOs who participated said to us, this conversation is really important. You have to keep it. You have to keep it going. And and we don't want to just talk. We want to know that we're having an effect. And so out of that, we created something called the Fortune CEO Initiative, which is now about a, a community of about 200 CEOs that are focusing on how do you maximize your social impact at the same time you're maximizing your financial impact. Uh, that, oh, that's a great story. Let's talk about t other tipping points. So to me, that story and you're you're feeling it in your in your soul, which is great. And that maybe that's uh, some influence on your sub ed. Um, what about other tipping points? What about, you know, I talk a lot about the Larry Fink declaration about purpose in 2018. Um, so and then there's also the the, B, the BRT business roundtable. So can you talk about how you started seeing significant proof points and pivots in the marketplace? Because so this is real. This is not like the nicey, nicey, soft stuff. This is real. I am, as as I've said, a lifelong journalist. And we as a tribe are, are skeptics, uh, if if not pure cynics. And, and, and so, you know, I approached all of this at first with the skepticism that's inherent in my nature and my job. 
But but I would I would start, Carol, with the Great Recession, because I think that's when you really started to see this change happening, at least in the U.S. Uh, uh, there was a uh, there was a speech made by Bill Gates at Davos in 2008, which was the year he was stepping down as the CEO of Microsoft. The, the recession really shook people's faith in markets and in the system. And in that speech, Bill Gates talks about the need for a new creative capitalism, he called it. Not long after that, Michael Porter, the professor at Harvard Business School, was uh, talking about shared value capitalism. Uh, John Mackey, who created, who had built uh, uh, Whole, Whole Foods, yeah, started talking about conscious capitalism. Mark Benioff started talking about compassionate capitalism. <laughs> Suddenly, in, in the years after the Great Recession, a lot of people felt the need to put a modifier before capitalism. So to me, that was an important sign. So something needs to change here. We're not doing this as well as we can or should or need to to maintain our legitimacy. I think that was a tipping point. I've already said 2016 was a tipping point with the Brexit vote and the crazy U.S. election and the meeting at the Vatican. Uh, uh, and I believe the... Uh, Speaking out that happened in 2014, 15, 16 by Benioff in Indiana, Bank of America in North Carolina, Ed Bastian in, in Atlanta, that was an important point. The business roundtable statement, which happened in August of 2019, was kind of a confirmation that this was real. It, it was happening. I had been writing about it, but when the business roundtable of all things, you know, sort of the ultimate uh, voice of a big business decides, hey, we're not just about shareholders. We are about employees, uh, uh, customers, their, the communities they live in, and the planet, as well as about shareholders. I, I thought that was a, 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 very, a, a very big, uh, substantial tipping point. And you're talking about the term stakeholder capitalism. And interestingly, because you named all the stakeholders, but people were talking about Mother Earth as one of the stakeholders. As a stakeholder. Yes, yeah. which, which, which was great. You didn't spend that much time in that comment, Alan, about Larry Fink. And I'm just curious, is that... Um, you know, BlackRock in terms of, you know, you know, it was seven trillion and now it's 10 trillion and whatever. And he's made prognostications. He said 2018, 2019. Then he talked about climate risk. And I need to see that, you know, we're going to invest in companies that have plans. Where do you, what's his role in all this? I think it's significant. But, you know, we've already talked to Carol about how the initial impetus for this, I think, came from employees. It was really an employee movement first. And any CEO I ever asked the question would said that, um, uh, so, you know, the when you said, why are you doing this? The answer, the first answer was always employees. I think consumers were a little bit slower to the game. Not that consumers didn't say, oh, I care about the planet and I care about people being treated justly, but their willingness to actually spend money to express that <laughs> was pretty limited until I would say four or five years ago. And then you started to see brands like Patagonia or, or Ikea or others. Yeah. I, yeah. Panera I actually make some, make some progress on this. Investors in my mind were the last to the game. I, I, I some of the, union pension funds, you know, the Calpers and the Calsters uh, were there. Uh, but, but I, I do think from, in terms of investor interest in this movement, the Larry Fink letters were a very important uh, uh, tipping point. Uh, the The problem with investors, and it's really a problem of the whole movement at this point, is until you have a kind of a consistent and agreed upon set of metrics, it's very hard to get your arms around what's real and what's uh, greenwashing or or purpose washing. So great! That's terrific segue. We'll get into purpose washing later, but let's get the segue to just capital and measurement and employees. And I, and I am, I have been talking employees till the cows came. I mean, really, I was like one of the earliest ones because I felt it with, you know, when you look at Avon and when Jim Preston said to me, you know, I know that we give them something in their head and they can sell the stuff, but I want to reach them in their heart. Talking about 1.6 million 
Avon ladies. Now, they're even contractors. They're not even employees. But he knew he needed to create that bridge, that loyalty very, very early on. Paul Fireman did it, too. Um, so let's talk about Just Capital, because um, I love Martin. He, he's been on the show many times. Um, and they use data. And, and they've asked the public, you know, what do you feel are the most important tenets of a just company. So can we talk about the role of just capital? Because I know you're a fan. Um, the And then talk some more about employees. I'm a big fan of just capital. I think it, it was a little slow to get going because it was one it was one of these efforts. As you know, it was initially funded by Paul, Paul Tudor, Tudor Jones, Jones, which is kind of an oxymoron, made, right? Yeah, yeah, he made billions. Of, <laughs> he, he, he made billions of dollars as a hedge fund. And then when he had made m- more money than God, he said, and now I, now I'm going to make the world a better place. Uh, and, and but but Martin's Martin's head is in the right place and he's he's worked hard to build it up and to. And I liked their approach, which was to say, we're not going to opine from high on what makes a company just. We're going to ask people. Uh, And they based it all on polling. And what they found was how you treat your employees was first and foremost. You know, do you you pay them fairly? Do you treat them well? Um, I think that was an important contribution to the debate. And I think coming up with a set of metrics so you could actually rank companies was a very important very important uh, piece of this. So I give them huge credit. Yeah. And, and it's, and I used to work, I represented the Everglades foundation and Paul Tudor Jones was like, you know, was the chairman of the board there. So I watched that shift to, to, yeah, a little slow out of the gate. And then, you know, the fact that when they surveyed the public and 50%, not 25, not 30, 50% of their responses were about employee um, value and treatment and things like that. That that was a real blinking light. I loved it. Great organization for our listeners. They have great information. The Just One Hundred. They have newsletters. They're terrific. So next, you know, along with next to a CEO Daily and Leadership Next and Alan's great book. You you got to you know you, Just Capital is absolutely one of our faves. I, I don't want to diminish the environmental movement because I think what's happened in the last couple of years on that front is huge. But two things happened to accelerate the direction that Just Capital was pushing in in terms of how you treat your employees. One was the pandemic, as I already mentioned. People said, wow, our, this is a real threat to the people who work for us, and we can't survive without those people. And, and so you saw really uh, one company after another doubling down on the focus on employees and then the second thing was coming out of the pandemic with this strong economy and the huge uh, stimulus that had put into the economy, as well as many people choosing to step back and pull out of the labor force. What's referred to as the great resignation. I'm not crazy about that yeah. term, but <laughs> there's something unprecedented going on in the labor market. And I think those things together have sort of made more and more companies realize, wow, are are among the stakeholders uh, the, the first one we have to tend to is our employees i i think this is really important for people who think this is a fad or people who think it's a bunch of woke ceos there's a statistic that i use in the book to really drive home how this reflects fundamental changes in the economy and it's this if you go back 50 years and you look at the balance sheets of the Fortune 500 companies, what you what you will find is that more than 80 percent of the value of those companies on their balance sheets was physical stuff. Right. It, yeah, it was plants. It was equipment. It was oil in the ground. It was inventory on the shelves. And that's all the stuff that had to be supported by finance. So. In a world where 80% of your value is derived from physical assets, which have to be financed, it makes sense to focus on returns to capital, returns to shareholders. If you do the same exercise today, you'll find that more than 85% of the value of the Fortune 500 is intangibles. It's intellectual property. It is software. 
it's brand value, which has to do with your emotional connection with your customers. And if, and, and those are all things that are derived from people from human ingenuity. And, and so, so anybody who looks at where the value is coming from today versus 50 years ago has to come to the conclusion that we need a much, a much greater focus on returns to people as opposed to returns to shareholders. Uh, and those people include first and foremost, your employees, but also the connection with your customers, the communities they live in, and ultimately the planet they inhabit. Human ingenuity. Um, you know, what's amazing about you, Alan, is that frequently journalists are great with words, writing words, but they're not, they're usually more introverted, many of them, but you are both an excellent, incredible speaker um, as well as a writer. So I think I just have to like, you know, I, I love your words and I, and I love just reading you. You're great. Well, that's very, very kind of you to say. We were talking before uh, the podcast started, and you mentioned noticing in the book that my father had been an, a community theater actor. I feel like that's what he he. I, I didn't realize this for a long time. He was also a salesperson, by the way, and those those things went together very nicely for him. Uh, but I, I think I, I must have inherited some of that from him. Well, you know, I, I, I'm going to just. This is totally unrelated, but my favorite interview questions are these two questions. What's the most important thing you learned from your mother? And what's the most important thing you learned from your father? And I just find in, in my history of 40 years and, and bringing colleagues into Cone, and, and I've actually, in my new iteration, Carol Cone on Purpose, I've brought my old colleagues back, which is like so cool. And um, the apple does not fall far from the tree. Well, I, I was I was very fortunate. I, I, I did great on both scores. You want to know the most important thing? thing I learned from my mother. I, sure. Oh, I'd love to. Yeah. Uh, you, you already got my father, but uh, my mother, it was, it was integrity. Uh, I mentioned that my father was a salesperson. We moved to the South, uh, to Chattanooga, Tennessee in 1963, which was a kind of a difficult time in terms of race relations as right when force busing was coming into a lot of these communities. And there was a the, the, I, I guess I was a kid. I was in second grade, but I guess I got some of that just having a northern accent, you know, got some of the, the pushback. But my mother and I saw her do this many times. My mother made it a practice whenever she was sitting in a group that made racially insensitive comments. She would just not demonstrably. She would just stand up and walk out of the room. And I saw her do it. And I was, as I said, I was a kid. I was in second grade. I didn't, and she, she didn't make a comment. She didn't make a statement. She didn't, she, she did it fairly quietly. I, I think sometimes probably the only person who really knows was my father, who it, it irritated him to no end, I'm sure, because these were often his friends or his business partners. But, but it was a, it was a huge lesson that you cannot be a bystander. On the on the uh, great issues of our times, that we are all we all have a role to play, and that uh, being a, a, a passive uh, person sitting on the side just isn't an option. You have to play your part. We're going to pause here with this amazing conversation with Alan, and we're going to pick it up as we talk about the role of the board in stakeholder-based capitalism. And we're going to talk about the newly introduced Modern Board 25, a new ranking from Fortune that is truly using data to show the different ways that boards are approaching accountability for CEOs. So join me for part two. It will be just as great as part one. Part one. 